The standard definition of discernment is comprehension of fabrication, or sankaras. And you try to comprehend these fabrications in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Seeing on the one hand how some fabrications cause suffering and actually constitute suffering. Suffering itself is a fabrication. And on the other, how you can turn some of these fabrications into the path. Because the path is something you put together. Some people think the path is just being equanimous, learning how to just watch things arise and pass away and not get involved. But that equanimity, it turns out, is a kind of fabrication. And you need more than just equanimity in order to really understand things. And one of the best ways to develop discernment is actually to put the path together. It's like getting a chemistry set. You learn about the chemicals by mixing them in different ways. And the best way to do that is to mix the fabrications of your mind and your body in a way that gives rise to a sense of real stillness, so you can see things very, very clearly. And in the course of getting there, you really understand, this is what the mind does. This is how it deals with the breath, how it deals with feelings and perceptions, to create a state of becoming. And then from that state of becoming, when you're really solid and very clear, you can see the really subtle fabrications going on that you would m have missed otherwise. So we're focusing on the breath. This is called bodily fabrication. So how do you use this bodily fabrication to create a state of right concentration? As you watch the breath, you begin to notice there are feelings, and the way you breathe is going to be guided by your perception of what it actually means to breathe. There's a whole tribe of people out there who every time they say they focus on the breath, they point to their nose. And that's not the only place where you feel the breath. In fact, it's important, if that's your perception of what the breath is, you can. it's important to realize that you can create a lot of tightness, a sense of constriction, as you try to focus everything on that one spot. And stop to think, when the Buddha is talking about right concentration, it says you want to have a sense of ease, fullness, refreshment going throughout the whole body. It comes up in waves through the body, or it's totally still and solid throughout the body. There's a sense of peace and that fills the body. Now, what kind of breath could lead you there? What perception of breathing could lead you there? This is where it's useful to think of the breathing as a whole body process. The breath is not the air, it's the energy that allows the air to come in. And that's only one aspect of the energy. There are other energies that flow throughout the body. And so you can think of these energies coming in waves to the body as you breathe in and breathe out. And that can get you to one level of concentration. It allows the mind to settle down with a sense of spaciousness, so that you're not clamping down on one spot in the body. And then you think further, there's what the John Lee calls the visiting breath, and then there's the resident breath. The resident breath is a sense of energy that's there all the time, like the cosmic background radiation from the Big Bang. It's always there in the background. If you hold that perception of breath in mind, think of all the blood vessels and all the nerves as being breath channels. And they connect throughout the body, out to every pore. And if one part of the body seems to be starved of breath energy, where can it get that energy from? If it has to pull it in from outside, it's disturbing. How about allowing it to flow in from other parts of the body? Think of everything connecting up, connecting up, connecting up, and just go through the whole body. 
with that perception of allowing things to connect. And that your body is open on all sides like a sponge. And then notice how that goes, how it feels. That noticing, that's called evaluation. That's verbal fabrication. So you direct your thoughts to the breath, that's another type of verbal fabrication, and then you hold certain perceptions in mind of the breath and try to develop a perception that allows the mind to settle down with a sense of ease and refreshment filling the body. Okay, the feeling of ease and refreshment, that's mental fabrication. And the perceptions that you hold in mind of the breath, that's mental fabrication as well. So you've got all the three major kinds of fabrication right here, bodily, verbal, mental. And you're putting them together to create a sense of ease and well-being, this state of becoming in the present moment that's called right concentration. So it's through mixing the chemicals that you learn about chemistry, dealing with fabrication, that you learn about the processes of fabrication. And you begin to see subtle levels of fabrication in the mind that you may not have noticed otherwise, assumptions that you carried around, for instance, about the breath. And you'll catch yourself as you do this, sometimes thinking of the breath shrinking as it goes out forgetting that there is this resident breath. If your sense of energy shrinks with every out-breath and your awareness shrinks with every out-breath, you're not going to be able to create that state of full-body, still, constant awareness that the Buddha is asking you to develop. So on the one hand, you want to keep in mind his descriptions of right concentration. On the other hand, watch what you're doing and use the descriptions as a way of evaluating. Are you getting there or not? Or if not, What's wrong with your perception? What's wrong with the way you breathe? What's wrong about the way you're thinking about these things and evaluating them? Could you do this more skillfully? This requires that you use your ingenuity. It's an aspect of discernment that gets all too often overlooked. But it's something you have to strengthen all the way through the path, not only in concentration, but when you're developing the your virtues, working with the precepts. You find yourself running up against situations in which you know that if you stick very narrow-mindedly to the precept, you may be causing trouble. So how do you stick with it and yet do it in a way you're not breaking the precept and yet you avoid the trouble? You've got to use your ingenuity, like cases where you don't want to tell the whole truth because you know that somebody's going to get damaged. So how do you change the subject? You have to use your ingenuity. If there are ants in your house, other pests in the house, how do you get rid of them without killing them? I mean, the dumb way is to just go around killing them. That doesn't take much intelligence. The ingenious way is to figure out how do we get the, the pests out and not kill them at all. And this issue came up once in a discussion group, talking about ants, and someone complained, gee, a really profound subject here, dealing with ants in the house. And I said, look, if you can't figure out an intelligent way to rid your house of ants without killing them, how are you going to figure out more subtle things? This is a good test of your ingenuity right here. It's a good test of how you fabricate a situation, how you perceive it, how you think about it. This applies to all aspects of life, the way you talk with other people, the way you have dealings with other people, the way you deal with hardships in life. All of these are a test of your ingenuity. and a test of your ability to fabricate a state of mind that doesn't suffer in the face of difficulties, hardships, the rough and tumble of every day. 
that's an aspect of discernment as well. So the way we strengthen discernment is by looking at every opportunity we have in life to understand how we're fabricating a particular situation through our perception of it, and how we can change our perception about the opportunities. The alternatives that are available to us. So it comes back down to that standard description of how discernment develops and how it's made strong. It's through virtue and concentration. And it's not that discernment is the end product that comes once the concentration is developed. It's in the process of developing the concentration. It's in the process of working with the challenges of the precepts that your, dis that your discernment grows. <clears throat>